Domestic violence in Australia. One in three Australian women will experience some form of family violence in their lifetime. One in five Australian women will experience some form of sexual abuse. We know that family violence is the leading cause of death, disability and injury to Australian women aged between 16 and 44. But what do we know about queer domestic violence? Today we're going to hopefully shine a light on the dark side of the rainbow. Hi, welcome to the show. I'm Anthony Leckis, and today we're talking about domestic violence. Matthew and Russ from My Other Closet, The Cabaret, thanks for chatting with me. Hey, Anthony. Nice to be here. Well, nice of you to come to our house and interview us Great. in our own lounge room. Exactly, right. Well, it's a lovely space. <laughs> well, we are going into your home. We're going to be going very closely into your home, and in particular, your home, Russ, and your, your, the history of your relationship, uh, previous relationship of yours which um, out of that relationship emerged this cabaret show about domestic violence. Why do a cabaret show about domestic violence? It's a, uh, it's a subject that uh, there hasn't been um, a lot talked about. Um, in fact, within our own community, the, you know, the, the queer community, um, people tend to avoid the subject. And... I felt that it was, or we felt that it was very important to expose the fact that, you know, people in queer relationships experience DV at pretty much the same rates, um, and some areas of uh, the queer community experience it at even higher rates um, than the heterosexual community. However, we don't talk about it. So if it's so prevalent in the community, why aren't we talking about it more often? Well, I think um, what... What the research shows is that we, there's a couple of reasons why the queer community doesn't um, acknowledge domestic violence very well, um, because the dominant message is so often conflated with men's violence against women. We say domestic violence, and half the time in the community, in the general community, we actually mean men's violence against women, or we say men's violence against women when we're talking about bigger and broader concepts. And so I think that heteronormative dominant um, discourse makes it really hard for queer people to even recognize that DV is what they're experiencing when they're in the thick of it. Um, one of the other things that we know is there's an enormous pressure on um, the queer community. We've, we've spent a long time trying to convince the, uh, the rest of the world that our relationships are valid, that our love is equal. Um, and so it, it's a lot to actually um, say, well, I, you know, sometimes our relationships are toxic and they're really bad for us, just like the heterosexual community. Um, but, you know, we have this extra pressure to be even more fantastic at relationships so that we could please get married and have the same amount of f freedom and equality as you. So if we don't, we don't have marriage equality yet in Australia here in 2017, so without that level of um, legitimacy, visibility, and I guess you're talking about protection also, then queer relation, people in queer relationships, they're left thinking that what might be happening in their relationship is not like what happens in heterosexual relationships? This can't be domestic violence? I think it's interesting that uh, as, a, as a, a queer person, um, what are your gauges? What, how, do, how do you gauge that the relationship that you're in is a domestic violent relationship? Well, well Russ, how did you do it? How did you... Because we'll talk about the show in a minute, but... How, what was your sense making along the way if we in queer relationships don't have a template for understanding abuse when it happens? I, I guess in my own situation, it took me five years to get out of a relationship that was toxic, that was bad for me uh, b because I didn't realise that I was in a, an abusive relationship. Um, again, there were no gauges. There, there was no one for me to talk to. There was there were no services available that were able to clarify what I was going through, um, and because of that, I actually didn't realise I was. I think interestingly, when we first got together and we're talking about that, like I had some access to the um, the sector, and so I did know a little bit about what. Um, what are classic signs of domestic violence? And to, so for Russ to describe his past experience and for me to say, 
you know, that's a classic tactic. That's, um, you know, that is isolating you. That, that was that person, um, you know, making you walk on eggshells. That was the wooing phase. That was the honeymoon phase. Like to see how closely you can overlay the classic signs and symptoms um, from straight domestic violence situations, men's violence against women, onto many queer relationships. I think it was interesting for, for, for us um, the, to kind of, have such a, a immediate, um, real example of that. You, you mentioned the word clarity around um, not having clarity around it, and, and Matt, when you were talking then, did, and you did you have this conversation when you were sort of sharing those fa stages that you mentioned? Um, it, is is that the clarity that you were sort of looking for to tr try and sort of say yes, that's me, that's what that's what was happening? When Matthew and I were having the conversation, I was well out of that relationship. So uh, my clarity came to me in a thud. Um, and uh, that clarity was, uh, you know, the result or, or the result of that clarity was broken bones and hospital visits and all sorts of things. So um, I, I realised where I was at much before uh, these conversations were taking place. Your clarity came to you in the thud, as you said, and I'm just wondering about, you used the word tactics earlier, Matt, around sort of tactics of abuse that are used against people in relationships. And, and, and we understand sometimes that people end up in hospital, that's up at the sort of pointy end of domestic violence, isn't it? Uh, where sort of other people start to take what's happening in your relationship very seriously, because there are injuries, there is, police might have come out. But what about sort of up the other end, sort of along the way when you were sort of... Did, was there a sense of, I'm not sure if this is domestic abuse or, or was that just not something you considered because it just didn't exist in queer relationships, in, in our opinion? I never had the words. I never, ever had the words. I knew in, my, in myself, I knew, I believed that, that there was something not quite right about this relationship that I was in. Um, it, it, it didn't happen on day one. It, you know, it, it was something that was progressive and uh, it crept up on me. What did you notice? What was the thing that crept up where you started to realise something's happening here? For me, it was um, a, very much a, 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 a change of... A change of attitude, a change of um, a, a change of the way in which I was being treated. It was, um, you know, just little niggly things that were coming into this relationship that I had that, you know, at the six month mark um, culminated in a broken nose. Um, um, and, and that was really from, from my perspective, um, that was the beginning of the violence. Um, the the first six months probably were were very much grooming me for uh, what was about to come. What was about to come. Matt, can I just? And you've worked in the sector, and you've worked in family violence, and you're a family violence researcher. When when you uh, and when you met Russ and he started to share this story with you, what was the, some of the things that were coming up for you as you were sort of listening to this? Not just as his partner, but also as a as a researcher and a worker in uh, the. Well, I actually hadn't done a lot of work in the space at that time. It's sort of um, as we've got more involved in the show, and as we, I mean, the show came to us. Uh, we were in Adelaide at Adelaide Fringe watching just a series of cabarets and. We actually met, I was Rusty's uh, manager for a while and he was a singer. Um, and then we kind of eventually acknowledged, oh wait, I think we're in love. So we'll just do that instead and <laughs> combine all the things. Um, but it was actually through the process of putting the show together. You know, we, we were in Adelaide, we'd seen all these things and I'd always got some advice when I was in school um, studying performance art that um, write about a topic that you know, you, that you have a unique insight into um, that you know other people don't and so we said you know as weird as it sounds Russ you're an amazing singer you have this really amazing story that is not that hasn't been told um why don't we turn it into a musical cabaret that sounds so insane that it's either going to work or be terrible uh, luckily I think we made it work um but so it was through that process over the last five years that um you know we've 
been a part of some of the earlier conversations in this space. Um, you know, we did the show up in New South Wales um, with the Acon Anti-Violence Project up there. And New South Wales has had a lot more time um, in, in the sector doing stuff specific towards LGBTI uh, victims. When we moved down here to Victoria, we realized that the sector here was a decade behind, really. Um, but, but where pretty much the rest of the world is. Um, and so, you know, there was some services doing some good work, but it had never been drawn together in the same way that the um, interagency up there had. So, you know, then the Royal Commission happened and all of a sudden everything was on the table and the attention was drawn towards LGBTI as, as um, priority victims for the very first time. Um, and things have just skyrocketed since there. How much of this show is about coming to the table also as opposed to, or perhaps in addition to your love for music and performing and, and, and cabaret and... Look, it's all, it, it, it's all part and parcel. Um, you know, performance was what, um, performance was what I, you know, I, I'd done and I'd loved for, for many, many years. Um, the subject matter was something that uh, we both believe just needs to be discussed. Um, cabaret? Well, cabaret has always had, um, has, has always been something where, uh, you know, you take something out of the ordinary, something political, a, something that needs to be discussed that's not discussed, uh, you know, in the general populace, and you put it on stage and you, you build something out of that. So this was the perfect platform for us to discuss a subject that people just don't want to talk about. And I think for us, um, you know, we'd seen some some really good um, education campaigns put out uh, in New South Wales, and um, you know, posters and uh, educational videos and things going out into the space. And what we think was missing and still is missing is, uh, and what we provide is a real emotional connection to the to to what it not only what these things look like but what they feel like on the inside and i think that's what we can it's what the show does really successfully is you join Russell on the story you you get to it smashes the myths that um that the victim is somehow weak or you know choosing the situation or why don't you just get on with it and get and go and leave and it, it really shows you how when you're in the middle of these situations you can't see the woods from the trees anymore and that and you know the the abuse tactics that are used on you belittle your self-esteem to the point where you don't see a doorway out um, and you start to believe that this is what you deserve um, and so I think with music and with um, the per the true personal story you can't deny you can you know most people when we say we're doing this show about queer domestic violence they go that happens to queers we never we never knew that i've never thought of that you can't deny it when it's a big hairy bear guy standing up there going i was a victim it's it's real with the the emotional connection that this show aims to to do is to connect with the audience emotionally we're talking about some pretty grim experiences and some pretty um, intense feelings. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Is that the intention to invite the audience into that space where they um, go, well, you said they go on that journey with Russ, do they, do they go to those places with you? If I'm doing it well, if, if I'm performing well, not performing is a really bad word, if, I am, if I'm taking people with me and doing it well, then they're experiencing all the things that I experience. Why do you want us to go there with you, Russ? Because that's the best way that you will understand. Um, and, you know, the purpose, of, the purpose of this show is to create understanding. Uh, it is a journey and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a show where, where people need to feel the things that I felt and that other victims or survivors of domestic violence feel. Because, Russ, I'm thinking you said earlier that, the, you know, you kept this to yourself. You didn't talk to anybody. You know, we in the commu queer community, we don't talk to anyone. And I, I, it's just interesting So I wonder if taking us to that place with you, getting very close to that place, means that you're not actually alone. If, if the audience sort of being there with you, does that also mean that we're there with you? Is, it something, is there somehow something cathartic in there for you? 
No, no. Uh, in all honesty, it, this is not the sort of show that you can do unless you're healed. Um, you know, I can't use this as a vessel to uh, assist my healing process because it would destroy me. I have to go back to those places every single night that I do the show to be able to take the audience there with me and that's not something that you can do if you're not healed. Right. But it's a really important journey for people to go on it's, it, because it creates understanding and understanding is the is what we're really trying to what we're really trying to have uh, have um, people be um, to understand. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think what what we know is that um, a lot of uh, service providers or professionals who have an obligation to screen for domestic violence, um, there's there's cases that we know of that people have point blank described very clear domestic violence, you know, um, with children involved, um, ch you know, abuse of a partner and the children at once. And because it was two women, the, it just was not clocked as DV. And, and even though there were multiple disclosures. And so what we know is also that's happening to people's family and in their friends and in their workplaces and really clear stuff is people are seeing it. And because it's not a man and a woman, we don't have the same triggers to go, wait a minute, that's not okay. You know, we don't have two decades of uh, awareness raising that, that has helped Australia move from where it was in the 70s where, you know, or 60s where it was, okay, of course it's fine for a man to beat his wife. You know, we've certainly moved on from that, but we haven't had the same dialogue around um, LGBTI domestic violence. So this is more than a show. This is a campaign this is a protest, this is a celebration about uh, resilience and survival, and this is um, a, a screening tool also? Well, certainly we have a few audience members in mind. I mean, we want it to be entertaining. It would be, uh, you know, we've all been to bad um, community theatre or, you know, educational theatre pieces where you're just like, oh, here's the key messages again. Oh, yeah, okay, here's the script telling me what I need to know. So we are really conscious of not doing that, of, uh, you know, you do come out knowing more about the topic and, uh, you know, we've specifically included messaging in there for if you are a person experiencing this, this is your pathway out. If you see this in your friends or relatives, this is what you can do to help them. You know, those, those messages are in there, but they're in there in a way that you're, you're being entertained and you're, it's starting a dialogue and you're motivated to, to, to care. Um, and, and when you see those things in the future, hopefully you reflect and you go, I remember what it felt like in the room to watch Russ have that experience. I remember when he talked about, you know, having those conversations with his friends and them not doing anything. I'm going to do something different in this situation. That's what we want. Is that the learning and understanding that you're talking about? I really want people that come and see this, that, 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 that tweak one thing that comes out of this show... Um, so that, you know, if they see something like that with their friends or their family or whatever, that, you know, they make the approach. They don't do the whole let's pull back. Mm. You know, be brave. Be brave. Go and talk to them. Ask the question because ultimately they may not be ready for it at that point but they know you're interested. And so when they are ready to talk, they will go and seek you out. It's exactly right. I think we, we talk about it, the metaphor we use is just drawing circles around it. And I think that's really important when you, we know that, uh, you know, if somebody says, I don't like your boyfriend, you should, you should uh, divorce them, you should leave, that, you know, that person is, has a lot, love is a complex thing. They have a lot of emotions attached to that person and they have been trained to defend them and defend the situation and try to cover it up. You know, really the, the victim is the strong one in a lot of ways. They're the ones trying to make it work. They're the ones keeping it all together, you know, uh, in the face of some really horrible stuff going on. Then that doesn't always get acknowledged, does it? Because when we talk about domestic violence, uh, I guess the first thing that we think about is the perpetrator's behaviour. You know, what sort of violence is being used? You know, we think about physical abuse, you know, verbal abuse, you know, destroying property, making threats, these kind of things. We're, we're so quick to conjure up images of what domestic violence looks like. 
But on the other side of domestic violence is those things that you talked about, the enormous strength and the... Um, I'm just wondering about sort of the sort of day, the, the ongoing and daily ways that you would have kept yourself safe and strong and um, resilient. You um, you learn you 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 learn what the what the triggers are. Um, you learn uh, you learn ways to um, to remain safe. Um, one one of them with me was to make sure that I always went to bed early and was asleep when he got home because if I was asleep then there was no excuse for any issue to happen. If I was awake and he was in the mood for whatever um, then you know that would escalate into something more. So it, you know it, they're little things but they're things that you keep in the back of your mind and they're, they're part of your they become part of your routine to keep yourself safe. And interestingly, I mean, we've had lots of conversations about how these things carry on. You know, obviously, uh, you know, we're in a relationship now and there's, there's stuff that hangs on. And, and one of them, interestingly, is that now Russ almost has this like Pavlovian dog response to uh, if we have a tiff and we have a disagreement about something, it tends to be about some area of the show. <laughs> <laughs> you are, you are the director. <laughs> yeah. We do tend to bring it home. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then, you know, he just gets droopy-eyed and he's ready for, to go to sleep because it's kind of a, uh, you know, become a... a Survival a, response. It was yeah. a learnt, it was, it's a learnt response. Yeah. It's a learnt response. Right. And, uh, yeah, if I'm, not, if, I'm not, if I'm not there, then I'm not there. Well, can I ask then about that, about impact, you know, uh, post that relationship and, and you both doing something incredibly gorgeous about this experience and really offering our community here in Melbourne and I know it's been to Sydney as well for us to, um, to learn so much about. What does this mean for your relationship in, in, in terms of um, not just working together as colleagues, but what, how do you decide sort of what goes into the show, what, what doesn't go into the show? Uh, look... Right from day one, um, Matt and I both uh, were adamant that if we were going to put the effort into this, then this show had to have integrity. So what goes into the show is anything that gives it integrity. What uh, doesn't go into the show is anything on the peripheral. And the, other, the other tool that we've discovered, we have this amazing dramaturge, um, Jess Murphy, who, um, you know, it also comes in, not only is she very skilled and really gets how to communicate, uh, you know, a message and a story, and so she can make those decisions and go, um, especially if we're disagreeing on something, Jess, she is, really the, gets Jess me. is the deciding she vote. She really gets yeah. me. I love Jess. So <laughs> she can come in and go, no, Matt, that's not important. Actually, what Russ is saying, that's more important. And we just go, okay, cool. Right. right. Or, or she will say, Russ, suck it up. Yeah. <laughs> suck That's it right. Up. That's really important. you got to say it. Right. Well, yeah. I ask because it's, we're talking about um, a very personal story yeah. as well as putting a show together, a product, yeah. you mm -hmm. know. And uh, so I could imagine there would be um, around the decision-making process around what will go in and what will, will be left out. Because, Matt, you, you – I mean – being a survivor of family violence is something you also know about as well. It's something that you both know about. You, I'm just wondering, if, is this, do you connect on that level as well? I think it was important for us, especially early on in our relationship, to have both have a clear understanding of what domestic violence looks and feels like. Um, it allowed us to be able to spot those triggers, um, know when we, in fact, were not having conversations with each other. We were con ha having conversations with the ghosts of ghosts our past. Ghosts of relationship past. Um, yeah. and learning Is that the next how cabaret? To, yeah. <laughs> 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 um, and learning how to acknowledge that, um, I think, was really important. It, but it has also allowed us to, you know, it's not easy to put on an independent theatre cabaret, especially to try to convince uh, people that, a cabaret about domestic violence is a good idea to come and see. That it's going to be fun. That you're going to enjoy yourself. You know, <laughs> that it's that's a big ask. So it also helps that we both um, are extremely passionate about getting this out there um, and and tenacious. And you know, it's important to us. I think what's not been done is there's. 
a lot of the, even in the, main, in the men's violence against women space, like you said, there's a lot of messaging towards real men don't hit women. You know, stuff that perpetuates heteronormative gender role crap, but also is all about, uh, you know, men have the strength to stop this. And a lot of the messaging is out there saying that, that who needs to be at the table? You know, the blokes. When actually there's very little going out there going, guess what, women? Women, you're amazing. You are fabulous people that do not deserve this crap. If he tells you that is what you deserve, he's dead wrong because you're an amazing individual. And I think what we really love about how we've put the show together is that it also speaks directly to, to victims and, to, and says, you're amazing, you're a strong individual, you're fabulous, you don't deserve this. You know, whatever they're telling you, it's wrong. You know, they're the problem, not you. And I think, I think that's important to us as I think, well. I think the other side of it too, that, that when we first started this, I wasn't, it, it wasn't a direction I was going in at all, but after us researching and working on this for a while, um, I, actually, I actually have an understanding for the other side as well. You know, this is not a one-way street. This is a two-way street, and there are two victims here. The, per the, the person who is receiving, uh, on the receiving side of the violence, but also the person who is, who is the, who's perpetrating this. Um, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not people to be angry with. They're people that need some understanding because there are reasons for this. So, you know, every, everyone involved in this situation is, starts off as a loser. Yeah, I think, you know? I mean, perpetrators still need to take account. Uh, yes, they uh, do. They still need to... Um take responsibility for their actions. Yes, We're they certainly do. certainly not saying that, but, um, you know, I think that some of the more modern ways of looking at intimate partner violence is that both people are making unhealthy decisions and both people need to look at those uh, behaviours and decision-making and need need assistance to change that behaviour because it's it's really not all right to to be using violence and, and you know, it's... It, a person's not in a good space if they're on the receiving end of that and think that they deserve it or they can't do any better or or they can't get out of it or you know and make the make the decision to 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 try to get it together you know all of that is is not good for anybody it it, it sounds incredibly complex there's so much isn't there around um the, this situation with you, you talked about the two people being involved and I'm just wondering about um, how do you, because I, cause I wonder, because we all have this idea about people who survive family violence about the sorts of things that they might say about that relationship also, and um, and I guess to to hear someone speak about the um, person perpetrating that violence with some level of compassion is not something that some of us might expect as well. Is that is that has that taken um, perhaps um, some time to get to that place? Oh, for only you? fifteen years, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> only fifteen years for okay. me to get my head around uh, around that. And again, uh, the only way that I can do that is because I'm healed. You know, whilst I wasn't, uh, that is a conversation that I could never have had. So let me ask about the healing and the the struggle also. I'm wondering, I'm thinking about the show and the songs that are in the show. Yeah. It is a cabaret, let's not forget that. Yes. There are some very specific songs that you've chosen to be able to get this message across. Um, can you talk a little bit about what, what, what song is the... Why have you chosen those particular songs without giving too much away? We want people to go and see the show. Um, uh, look, there's, look, there's a couple of songs in there that are uh, particularly tongue-in-cheek. Um, there is there is a moment when there is a moment when I talk about you know um, having these thoughts of leaving this relationship and then uh, going right back into uh, justifying why I'm not going to and then going and telling the audience uh, how I'm going to make this relationship work and the song that we use for that is Stand By Your Man. Now, if you ever... And I'm not going to go through the words here, but, you know, people need to go and listen to that because it's a bloody terrible song. Right. right. You know, it's a terrible song. Right. Uh, interestingly, yeah, a lot of the music <laughs> that we chose 
shows you how much messaging there is out there in the mainstream discourse, you know, in popular culture that is really problematic and gross. You know, Stand, uh, stand By Your Man is basically saying to women, no matter what he does, your obligation is to just stand by him because Support he's him. a man exactly. and he'll do things that you don't understand and but stand but you got to stand by him. Yeah, and like, it's him. some gross messaging yeah. and it's not uncommon for that right. to be, uh, mm. you know, pretty... It's all out there. I think one of the things I would say is that um, early in the show's development, we looked at the fact that uh, that one of Russell's escape mechanisms and uh, therapy has always been singing. Um, and so we use that uh, in the show to give us a device to be able to justify breaking into song, basically. Right. Um, so early in the show, we set up that um, that idea that he's using that escape mechanism turns into um, that it's a fantasy. That actually, um, if I just keep singing and dancing and singing and dancing and I live in this fantasy world, I don't have to acknowledge the reality that I'm in. Um, so it gives us a reason. The audience is brought into that. We're saying, you're, you're a part of the fantasy. You're only here seeing this situation because I've made you up to try to cope with this situation. You know, um, and I think th that works really well. I'm, that was some, we had a great writer who helped us kind of pull out some of those themes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, so then, then looking for material and looking at songs and how to express different feelings. And, uh, you know, we, we only use pop songs, so it's all covers. Um, and they're all songs that you would recognize. And again, we did that deliberately because we want as much as possible for people to relate to what's going on on stage. And if it's a song that you recognize, but you're like, you're either going, oh, he tweaked the, those lyrics only a tiny bit and now suddenly it fits so well, or you're going, whoa, he says the lyrics exactly how they are and I never thought to listen to how, like Luca, for example, is, is one that, uh, Suzanne Vega, that is a beautiful song about experiencing domestic violence and she's sort of addressing her neighbor saying, uh, you know, if you hear a noise late at night, you know, don't worry about it. Don't come and ask me questions. I just ran into the door again. So we, we were talking not so long ago uh, about the play My Other Closet. And there's a, there's, a, there's a process that happens that the audience don't get to see. So I know you mentioned that you, you try to take us on this journey very intimately. You take us very closely to your experience. But there's an experience that unfolds for you as you're performing um, that um, people won't know about. And I guess that was the fact that you still worry about um, ha having this level of attention to the abuse that you experience because perhaps the perpetrator might notice or he might come across the play or, or may even turn up to watch it. I think uh, very interesting that, uh, that you, know, you bring that one up because that is, that is a very real uh, thing that, um, people who have experienced uh, violence in relationships uh, deal with. Um, you know, you're very careful not to name people. You're, uh, you, you've spent such a long time protecting yourself um, that, you know, something like this show uh, just exposes you again to uh, potentially to that person. Um, and who knows? Who knows what the results of that... Uh, will be. I mean, again, you know, I'm at the point now where, and I and and I believe um, very firmly that the person that I was involved with, that was involved in this situation with me, uh, wouldn't even acknowledge that this story was about them. So. It's true. Like if you if you acknowledge, hey, wait, you're saying all this horrible stuff about me, then you acknowledge that it's about you. And, exactly. You know, um, but but it's a thing that's really interesting to consider. And I've had conversations with people who have been the victims of sexual assault or um, intimate partner violence. And it's a funny line of like, am I um, am I censoring what I'm saying because I'm still protecting that person or am I protecting myself? You know, and I think that's a, that's a different line for everyone. Um, but it's it's an interesting conversation. Where where are we still as victims being silenced um, and being told that we don't get to tell our side of the story? Um, and where's the decision that you're actually going? No, I'm not going to give this person any power to come back into my life. 
from my perspective, from where I'm at for, um, for how, how much healing I've done, um, you know, I sit back and go, there is such an important message that needs to get out to people. Um, and, you know, if I, don't, if I don't put that message out, who's going to? So, uh, you know, it, it's really personal for me to, uh, to, you know, suck it up, if you like, and, um, and, and do what I've got to do to try and help somebody else that might be in that position get out. Well, it's it's an enormous contribution to the community. It's uh, it's an incredibly enormous um, a gift, I guess, that you're, you're offering us, not only to learn about um, domestic violence generally, but also more specifically your experience, because I'm guessing that not all experiences of domestic violence will look the same, but they may all have very similar themes that, that run across from one relationship to the next when, when um, power and control and abuse are, are prevalent. Well, you named it. I think that's exactly right. And I think that's an important message for people to understand that um, domestic violence doesn't mean physical violence. We tend to think that that's what it means and that's where our mind goes first. And yes, that was a part of Russell's relationship. It was very physically violent, um, but not all are. And and it, it just because it doesn't have physical abuse in it doesn't mean that it's not abusive. Um, you know, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, financial abuse, anything that's where one person has all the power and, and uses it to the detriment of the other is domestic violence. Mm. Um, and that it can also be outside of intimate partner violence. It doesn't have to be people in a, in a love, in a, romantic relationship, it can be uh, parent to child, you know, we're very used to this. Um, it's almost a cliche, the, the idea that a young person comes out and their dad yells at them and their mum cries and, you know, and all of that goes on or they get kicked out of the house and we kind of go, oh yeah, that's just a coming out story. But actually that's abuse. You know, that's a young person being told that you're not good enough. You know, who you are is not acceptable in our eyes. Uh, you know, and if it were for any other reason, yes. it, we would never look at that and go, oh, yeah, that's just not for me to say. You know, a teacher yeah. wouldn't hear a kid tell, talk about their family saying, my dad doesn't want me to have access to hormones because, you know, it won't allow me to transition to be my true gender. You know, if we were hearing someone say, I have cancer and dad won't let me be treated, you know, you'd be you'd be right. going, that's abuse. Right. Um, let's call in the authorities. You know, it's it's really quite interesting when you look at how how different it becomes when you're talking about uh, LGBTI people in abusive situations. Right. Well, in a way, it's a call to action. It broadens the accountability. This show does do that. It makes it, 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 there's no excuses, I guess. People will see themes in this show that they can now understand as domestic violence, um, which is information that they'll take with them. Has the show become everything you've wanted, wanted it to be? Or, or where, where's this going? Where, what's next for the show? Look, as far as I'm concerned, this show will um, happen for as long as it takes to make change. Um, and, and, you know, if, if, you know, if we can be a catalyst for that type of change through this show, then we're achieving absolutely everything. You know, one day I would like never to have to do this show again because I would really? like for uh, this not to be an issue anymore. We might do a different show that's really light and happy. Yeah, <laughs> right. A total well, comedy. Yeah. Well, we'll look forward to more shows from you guys, but we want to thank you so much for coming on the show and talking to us today about such an important issue, a very invisible issue. We're bringing some light to this issue. So thanks again for, for chatting to us and, and good luck with the show. Thanks, Anthony. If you've heard something in our conversation today that makes you think perhaps you're using control or abuse in your relationship, you can contact VAC at vac.org.au or QLife. If in our conversation today it's made you think about anyone you know, uh, maybe a colleague or a friend or a family member even, that this sounds like could be happening in their relationship, please head to um, qlife.org and speak to a volunteer counsellor about what you might be able to do to help that person. Um, or you can go to anothercloset.com.au and have a look at the information there for how bystanders can help someone experiencing violence. If anything in our conversation today has made you realise that maybe you're in a domestic violent relationship, contact Queerspace. They have a specialist LGBTI domestic violence support worker 
available to talk to you today. Alternatively, call QLife and talk to a volunteer counsellor.